Hello, I'm JW. This is part one of a series on surge protection devices, or SPDs. And here's a uh, fairly typical example. This happens to be a uh, two-module thing, which we'll look at again in more detail at some point in the future. Now, uh, this time we're going to have a look at the basics, such as uh, what are surges, why would you want to protect against them, and why it is that they have suddenly seemed to have become a thing, even though that surges and surge protection has been around for literally decades. So let's just cover the basics to start with, and then, say, in subsequent parts, we'll have a look at various parts of it in more detail. Now, I so said their surges aren't new. They have literally existed for as long as electricity has existed. And certainly surge protection, again, that's not new either. It hasn't been around pretty much forever. But uh, certainly it's the case that more recently things like this have become a thing, particularly in your domestic consumer units or smaller installations. And this is a cheap Chinese one. Main reason because in a future episode we're going to be taking this apart and seeing what's contained inside, but the principles, of course, are the same, whoever makes the thing. Now, let's have a look first of all what the surge actually is. Now, unfortunately, there are several definitions of the word surge, but of course it's only one of them we're actually concerned with here. So, uh, first of all, what is a surge? So, uh, in this particular case, what we're talking about is a transient overvoltage. Now, there's two words here, both of which uh, may not be entirely obvious, but uh, overvoltage basically means the voltage is far too high. So, in the UK, voltage is normally around 230 volts AC. In the case of overvoltage, in the case of surge, what we're talking about is many hundreds of volts more than that, and in some cases, many thousands of volts on top of that. So it's a significant increase from the normal 230 volts, so it might be sort of, say, 1,000 volts or 5,000 volts or something like that. Certainly not what you're going to be having in the normal event there. And then the other part here is the transient. This means it's extremely short in duration. It's not something that's going to stick around for any length of time. And uh, for typical surges, the duration or length of the overwatch existing is in the region of microseconds to milliseconds. Now a millisecond is one one thousandth of a second. And you might be familiar with that, things on like RCDs, which uh, would obviously trip and say things like uh, sort of 40 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds. And a microsecond is one millionth of a second. So these things exist for a very short time, a very tiny fraction of the AC waveform. But whilst they do exist, it is a very high voltage, many hundreds or thousands of volts more than you would normally get. So in the context of surge protection, this is what we're talking about. Very, very tiny little short pulses of extremely high voltage, far more than you'd normally have. Now, there is another definition of surge which uh, is also used in the electrical industry, and this is used within the distribution network. And it's things where, for example, if the neutral was disconnected, the voltage rather than being 230 might sort of go up to in the region of sort of 400 or 500 or something like that. And again, if there's some other problem within the network, it could uh, go out of range. But uh, that is something which typically exists over a period of many tens of seconds or even minutes. And it doesn't go particularly into the thousands of volts, it's only a few hundred. So the other definition of surge is valid. But in the case of surge protection, it is not what we're talking about. It's an entirely unrelated and separate thing. We're only talking about extremely high voltages for an extremely short period of time. Now what this would look like if you have your typical uh, AC waveform, so that's a zero there, and uh, the voltage of course is alternating, so it's changing all the time, in the case of a sine wave there, that would be a normal thing there. In the case of the UK, so it's 230 volts RMS, so your peak value here is going to be around the sort of 340 volts kind of area there, so that will be plus there, and that should be minus 340 volts over there. So on average, of course, the uh, RMS value, that's where your 230 comes from. So in the case of a surge or a transient overvoltage, it could be in either direction, it could be positive or negative, it doesn't really uh, matter there. And what you would actually see is that the waveform would be coming along like this, and then suddenly you'd have a huge spike like this for an incredibly short duration, and you might have another one here, so it might sort of go way off up there. And there might be another one here like that. So very, very short pulses, but uh, quite large in the actual total voltage there. Now in terms of where these can occur, it's going to be between any two conductors in the system. So between, say, line 
and neutral, which is where you'd normally find the normal voltage. And of course, it can also occur between line and the earth. So again, that's where you'd find your normal mode's voltage there. And uh, also, no, not as obviously, it can also occur between the neutral and the earth as well. Now, in some systems, of course, these two are actually linked together. So in your TN system, TNCS or TNS, those are going to be linked together at some point. But even in, a, say, a TNS system, it's going to be linked together at the transformer. Then you may have many tens or hundreds of metres of cabling between that and your house. So it's totally possible for these uh, spikes of voltage or transients to be induced on the cabling between there. So you can get these damaging voltages between neutral and earth as well. And on a TT system in particular, where you've got your earth is just an electrode in the ground, again, completely possible to have quite a damaging voltage between the incoming neutral conductor and your electrode in the ground there. So it can occur between all or some of those pretty much any time. And the other thing, of course, it can occur between, certainly on a three-phase system, is between two phases or two line conductors. So pretty much between any of the conductors that you have in a typical installation, and it can be found between any or, in fact, all of those things. And as well as the power cabling coming into the building, it can also be found on other types of cabling. So, for example, data cabling, telephone cabling, and you might have things like sort of TV aerials, satellite dishes, and in fact any kind of conductors which come into the building from some outside source. So although uh, certainly in terms of consumer unit or the electrical station, it's most likely to be between the actual conductors here. Don't forget about other conductive things coming into the building. Any of those things can and quite often do have surges or transient overvoltages on them, and it may be necessary to provide protection for these as well. And have a look at this uh, particular example here. We'll see that it's got three connections here, so line neutral and the earth or protective conductor there. So again, that would cover between all three of these combinations. And in the case of a uh, multi-phase device, of course, it would have additional modules for the additional phases as well. So uh, that's a fairly uh, typical example there. Now, where do these things come from? Well, there's several uh, causes for these things, and the uh, most likely cause here is lightning. Now, in most cases, we're not talking about lightning striking your house directly. Now, of course, that can happen in rare instances, but basically, if lightning is going to strike, say, domestic property directly, it's going to be a huge amount of damage, things end up on fire, half the wall is going to be blown out, and so on. So, although that is a possibility, generally that's not what we're talking about. So, lightning strikes, and there can be two types of these more likely to strike onto cabling. So we've got directly onto cables. And this will be cables outside of the actual installation, such as overhead lines or underground lines, or possibly onto things like transformers or other network equipment. And the other one is indirect strikes. And this is where you may have a lightning strike, say, between uh, one cloud and another. But because that's in the vicinity of some electrical cabling, you'll get an induced voltage on the cabling simply due to the fact that uh, you've got uh, inductive and capacitive effects there. So whilst this is fairly straightforward and obvious, the lightning strikes the cable, and then you get a large voltage on that cable. This one, you might say have a cloud here. It might be a cloud over there in the sky. And then below that on the ground, you might have some uh, poles here with cabling on them. So a direct strike in this case would just be from the cloud here onto the cabling itself. Of course that's going to induce a voltage on the cabling here. And then the indirect would be, say, from one cloud here, it could be a lightning strike through the air to another cloud. Because you've got a large current flowing here in parallel with another conductor, then of course you can get a voltage induced on the cabling just by the fact you've got a very high current flowing here, so either due to uh, inductive or capacitive effects there, and that can be coupled into the cabling, even though it doesn't directly strike the cable itself. Now those effects are not restricted only to overhead cabling. Now overhead cabling may be more likely to be, uh, say, either struck by lightning directly or have a voltage induced on it, but even if your cables are buried underground, as we've got here, then it's totally possible for lightning to actually strike these. So if there was lightning strike from this cloud here, it's going to strike the ground, it's still going to be putting a fairly substantial voltage onto these cables. Because bearing in mind, this lightning has just jumped from a cloud to the ground. That could be hundreds of metres. The fact you've got a cable buried, say, a couple of metres underground, 
pretty much irrelevant in terms of the scope of the uh, massive voltage and the huge current we've got going through here. And just as with the uh, indirect strikes, even indirect strikes across here, we're still going to get a huge magnetic field around this massive current flowing here. And again, that can actually affect anything within the vicinity, including stuff that's underground. And of course, you've also got a lot of other stuff above ground, like, say, transformers and uh, switching equipment and all kinds of other stuff. So pretty much lightning strikes anywhere are likely to have an effect on any kind of electrical equipment, whether it's in the ground, above ground, or pretty much anywhere else. Now, the second main cause is due to switching. And these were ones that were created within the electrical installation or the distribution network itself. And one uh, fairly common example was here. If you had a large electric motor, this is a massive inductive load. So uh, when it's spinning up, it's going to draw a fairly substantial current. But if you just uh, disconnect the power here by switching it off, the motor's still going to be turning. And because it's turning, it's going to act as a generator. And you're going to get a big pulse of voltage coming out of there back onto the conductors you've got. Now, if it's a double pole switch, probably not a problem, but of course, if it's a single pole switch, your neutral is still going to be connected, and that's going to put a uh, fairly large pulse of voltage back into the distribution equipment. So uh, any kind of inductive load there can cause this sort of thing, and also so can pretty much anything else. So even things like capacitive loads and whatever else, switching those on and off is going to cause disturbances on the electrical wiring within that building, and even in other buildings in some cases. So switching of uh, various loads can and often does cause transient over voltages, which again can cause problems for equipment elsewhere within the installation or even related installations nearby. Now, as I said before, surges like this or transient over voltages have existed pretty much the whole time that electricity has been in use because, of course, lightning strikes have been around since uh, millions of years and surge protection in itself isn't particularly new either. Again, it's been around for a very long time. So why is it that suddenly it seems to be a big thing well, the answer to that is that until fairly recently, most of what was in a typical installation wasn't actually going to be really affected by these transient over voltages. Or if it was, it didn't really cause any kind of a big problem. Because if you look at certain older equipment, so certainly in, say, a domestic uh, situation, if you have a look at what in a say, typical house uh, a few decades ago, you would have things like the uh, cooker or oven or whatever. All that was in there was basically a heating element and in most cases uh, several of them, but uh, it's just basically a resistor inside a metal casing. So shoving a fairly high voltage on that for a fraction of a second, probably not going to do any damage there. If it was high enough or long enough, it could theoretically arc over to the uh, earth casing and might cause some damage, but that's pretty unlikely. And of course, your typical lighting would be the incandescent lamp. And again, that's just basically a resistive element. When you shove current through it, it heats up and gets white hot to illuminate the room. So if you just shoved a very high voltage through there for a fraction of a second, it's going to slightly increase the temperature of that. But again, it's not really going to do anything. wouldn't even notice. If it was really extreme, it might cause the uh, thing to fail. But then, of course, you just go down the shops and buy a new one. And that would be like 50 pence or something. So even if it did bust, well, on the rare occasion it did, well, who cares? Because it probably was going to break anyway. So again, not really a big problem there. And although people had various other electronic items in their house, there wasn't a huge number of those things. And even what they did have there typically had what were called linear power supplies. So those are constructed internally. So you have your power coming in there. So say line and neutral. And the very first thing in, in there would be a transformer. So you had your 240 volts there as it would have been in the day. And then you have a little uh, winding there, probably for 12 volts there. Then you would have your bridge rectifier here. And you'd probably have a uh, few capacitors in there. And no doubt some kind of uh, voltage regulator. And then you'd eventually get your, say, 12 volts DC for your radio or whatever else. Now, although surges or transit over voltages can pass through transformers, in the case of this one here, if you're going to, say, shove a big pulse of, say, a few hundred volts there, it's going to be considerably smaller in magnitude when it gets through here. And because you've got all this other stuff on the side of this, by the time it gets to here, its effect is going to be significantly reduced. So even for electronics of the uh, sort of 20, 30 years ago, not likely to cause a huge problem. And again, uh, not something that's particularly common anyhow, because most people didn't have houses stuffed full of electronic devices. However, fast forward today, and uh, most electronic devices do not contain big uh, metal wound transformers with iron cores and whatever, because those are far too expensive and they're far too heavy. 
and they're far too big because uh, you're going to put one of those and everything, you're not going to have uh, any space for much else. So today, of course, uh, electronics are highly prevalent, and in most cases, the power supply for those is line and neutral coming in, and instead of a transformer and all those big copper windings and all that business, the very first thing in here is going to be some kind of microchip or electronic uh, silicon device there, and that is going to be directly across the 230 volts there, and then from that onwards you're going to have obviously various other components, there may be an extra connection here and so on, and then you're going to have your voltage coming out of there, and uh, in some cases it may just be a uh, single capacitor there, and then you're going to have your LED lights or whatever in here, might be another few smoothing items going in there, but uh, incredibly simple stuff. So if you're going to be shoving in here a fairly large voltage of say a uh, thousand volts for a very short time, it's incredibly likely that something in here is going to get damaged because uh, semiconductors unfortunately are extremely sensitive to transient over voltages. If this was say a uh, current voltage regulating device here, shove a big pulse of uh, very high voltage there even for a few microseconds, that can cause some kind of fault internally and it pretty much won't work anymore. And again, you've got, say, capacitors across the line rated for, say, uh, 450 volts. If you shove, say, 1,000 volts or 2,000 volts in there, fairly likely that this is going to fail. It will either fail open, in which case nothing works, or it could fail short circuit, in which case it's going to damage other things because the current is going to flow through there and destroy things. Now, if a uh, transit over voltage does cause damage to some electronic device, most of the time the damage is not going to be visible. This is mainly because the damage is going to be internal to, say, a chip or some other device, and you're not going to be able to see it. So if you open up something that's no longer working and you suspect it has been damaged by a surge or transient over-voltage, don't expect to see massive blackening and charring or whatever inside, because that's simply not what actually happens. In some cases there will be damage visible, that might be what would have happened here. So if this failed short circuit, what would then happen instead of a very small current throwing through the capacitor, you then get, say, the full mode voltage and the full current here, so you might find that all of these LEDs were completely blown because uh, you basically shoved the mains voltage across it and they could all be blackened and charred, but that damage is not because the surge itself, just that the surge itself damaged something and then the mains voltage powered through here and you got sort of 50 or 100 amps or something flowing on the circuit for a short time and that is what caused the damage. So. In many cases, any damage you can see has been caused by the mains voltage, which has perhaps been caused by some component failing and allowing far too much current to flow through some part of the circuit, and therefore that's when you'd see your charred and blackened items. But in a lot of cases, it is literally just some electronic component that's failed internally. You can't see any damage. The only visible thing is the fact that the item itself is no longer working. Now, as well as modern electronics being rather more susceptible to damage than certain bits of older equipment, the uh, other major problem is that electronics are now in pretty much everything, whereas in the past, of course, uh, most things didn't have them. So, as we saw previously, things like the oven or uh, fridge or things like that, in the past, of course, they didn't have those, but uh, as well as your usual electronic items you would find in your house, let's say you've just got your cooker or oven, which in the past was just a uh, box of some heating elements and a mechanical thermostat. Of course, these days, there's going to be an electronic control in there, and it's usually a clock or something along those lines. And of course, without this part, the rest of it doesn't actually work. On plenty of these, if you don't even set the clock correctly, the oven doesn't even turn on. And even things like, say, a fridge or a washing machine, which again in the past would just be a basic kind of a mechanical timer or mechanical thermostat or whatever, and of course, these days, a lot of things with motors in actually have inverter drives in there. So rather than the actual motor just being connected to the mains power and it needs to be switched on, it's actually run through another big box of electronics, so it varies the frequency and the power and whatever else as those are uh, more efficient. So again, a fairly common situation. And even without that particular style, you find that plenty of these actually have again electronic controls, so again, something goes wrong with that, clearly it's not going to work. And repairing that sort of thing is of course fairly expensive. And uh, some of the other items which uh, you may not have considered are things like the uh, central heating boiler, which again has a uh, printed circuit board inside which basically controls and runs the entire thing. And again if that's going to be broken, well guess what, it's going to be many hundreds of pounds to replace. 
And of course that's before we even get into things such as uh, smart devices, all of which are electronic of course by their nature. And of course this is going to be things such as uh, thermostats, cameras, doorbells like those ones that you can ring and it contacts your phone and uh, all that behind the business there. And obviously there's this whole uh, horde of other stuff which uh, of course people like to have in their homes now. And uh, even if you go back to simple things such as lighting, of course all lighting these days is LED. And guess what, of course LEDs are one of the very things which is easily damaged by transient over voltages. So even an LED lamp, all right, it's not going to be a huge cost to replace just one. But bear in mind that in the past you just have a single filament lamp hanging down in the centre of the room. These days, of course, you probably have, say, downlighters or whatever. Might have, say, eight or ten of those in the room. If a whole load of those get busted, again, that's not going to be a particularly cheap or desirable situation to be in. Now, there are some areas you might think, well, there's certainly nothing going to be of any value there. One of which might be a landlord's supply. And this is the kind of situation where you would have a block of flats or apartments, and then each flat obviously has its own individual power supply there. And the landlord supply is what connects and supplies power to the common areas. So normally that's going to be, say, just a few lights, a couple of sockets for the vacuum cleaner and whatever, and probably not much else. So I might be tempted to think in a situation like that, well, there's no point putting surge protection there because uh, nothing really is going to be damaged. But uh, that's not actually true because if you think about it, in the corridors or stairways there's going to be some lighting, and of course that's going to be LED lights in pretty much every case. So if you have, say, a block of lights with, say, 10 uh, LED light fixtures there, and six of them get busted, read some transit coming in, replacing those is not going to be just a question of popping in a new lamp or bulb there. More than likely you have to actually replace the whole fitting, and of course you have to have somebody come in and replace it. And again, that's not going to be uh, particularly cheap. It's certainly going to be more than £100 for the sort of cost of surge protection there. And another thing to consider that most uh, blocks of flats and things have a entry system. And even the most basic of these things can easily run into many hundreds of pounds, even if it's just, say, two or three flats. And of course, if it's a large block of flats and it has, say, a video system there, you could easily be looking at many thousands of pounds if parts of that became damaged or destroyed. And then there's always going to be other things such as the uh, fire alarm. Yeah, not something you want to be damaged or destroyed, and again, if it was, or some kind of problem occurred with that due to a transient, then repairs to that, again, are not going to be exactly bargain basement. So even in situations where you might not think there's an awful lot of equipment there, there quite often is, and again, most of it is going to be far more than the £100 or so it would cost to fit the surge protection. So let's look at surge protection, and specifically what these things are, and why you would want to protect against them. And certainly in any kind of modern installation, it's going to be stacked full of electronic equipment of various types, all of which is susceptible to damage by transient over-voltages, and therefore, say, claiming that, oh, there's nothing in my house of any value, it's going to be damaged, well, clearly that's a load of nonsense. And the things like lightning strikes are actually incredibly common. All right, there might be a lightning storm where you happen to live at the moment, but certainly across the country, lightning strikes happen all the time, and if there is a period of, say, bad weather or whatever, you can get thousands and thousands of these things within a very short time. And of course, it's not just about lightning, say, striking your house or in the general area. If it, say, strikes power lines far away, that over voltage can travel considerable distances. So it's not something which is rare or hardly ever happens. These things happen all the time, and all the equipment in the house is fairly vulnerable to these things. Now, uh, that's uh, just basically look there at uh, basically what they are and what you're going to protect against. In future episodes, obviously, we'll look at that in more detail and kind of what types of surge protection you can get and where you would fit such things. And we're also going to be taking some of these things apart to see what's contained inside. But until then, thanks for watching.